on literary criticism and uh, you know uh, it's very lucid and i think we can use this as a framework you know uh, before i go to the text which is given to you the printed material i would like to read out and explain from this book okay it's very lucid very simple to understand uh, whereas literary criticisms co concern with morality began with plato its emphasis on the elements of which a work is composed began with plato's famous pupil aristotle so aristotle taught us about the uh, told us about the components of uh, you know uh, the tragedy rejecting some of plato's beliefs about the nature of reality aristotle opts for a detailed investigation of the material world so he goes against plato's teachings he rejects plato's teachings and he launches he starts his own investigation okay uh now uh, uh, see aristotle you will see the father of so many modern subjects is considered to be aristotle okay so uh, he was also he, he was a very knowledgeable man aristotle he had knowledge of uh, the scientific methods applying his scientific methods of investigation to the study of literature aristotle answers plato's accusations against poetry in a series of lectures known as the poetics so uh, poetics is aristotle aristotle's works work in which he uh, you know responds to plato's criticism on poets unlike exoteric treatises meant for general publication the poetics is an esoteric work one meant for private circulation to those who attended the lyceum okay uh, so it was a particular school where youth were trained and this book was meant only for circulation within that although it lacks the unity and coherence of aristotle's other works it remains one of the most important critical influences on literary theory and criticism so his poetics which was meant for internal circulation in the lyceum which is a place where young people were educated that forms the basis for a lot of literary criticism and theory aristotle's poetics has become the cornerstone of western literary criticism by applying his analytic abilities to a definition of tragedy aristotle began in the poetics a discussion of the basic components of a literary work that continues to the present day. what are the basic components of a literary work okay unfortunately many critics and scholars mistakenly assume that poetics is a how to meaning and setting the standards for literature particularly tragedy for all times for all time aristotle's purpose however was not to formulate a series of absolute rules for evaluating a tragedy but to state the general principles of tragedy as he viewed them in his time while responding to many of plato's doctrines and arguments even his title the poetics reveals aristotle's purpose because in greek the word poetics means things that are made or crafted so he was trying to dissect he was trying to dissect what he saw around him uh, dissect tragedy poetry at the beginning of the poetics aristotle notes that epic poetry tragedy comedy dithyrambic poetry and most forms of flute and lyre playing all happen to be in general imitations although all of these imitations differ in how and what they imitate aristotle agrees with plato that all the arts are imitations okay uh 
I'll uh, skip most of it and I'll come to his conceptualization of tragedy because that is considered to be his chief contribution to literary criticism. Okay. A uh, tragedy is an imitation of nature that reflects a high form of art in exhibiting noble characters and noble deeds. The act of imitation itself giving us pleasure. So, uh, you know, a tragedy, uh, it involves the lives uh, and actions of noble people, people of high birth. You cannot have a ordinary person being described in a tragedy or being the central character in a tragedy. Okay. And the purpose of tragedy was to give us pleasure. Art possesses form. That is, tragedy, unlike life, has a defined beginning, a middle, and an end. And each of the parts being related to every other part. A tragedy then is an organic whole with its various parts all being formally interrelated. So there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. A tragedy also has all three parts. So you basically, and all are interconnected. All are interconnected. So it gives you the sense of uh, being one unified whole. It gives you the sense of being one unified whole. Uh, so it must be remembered that uh, what are referred to as the three classical unities. The classical unities are unity of time, place, and action. Okay, only the unity of action was mentioned specifically by Aristotle. Okay, and uh, you know uh, the other two unities of time and place, they were. Uh, later day, uh, you know, uh, inputs in the world of uh, tragedy. Or the kind of, it was uh, later developments in tragedy. In tragedy, concern for form must be given to the characters as well as to the structure of the drama. Because the tragic hero must be a man who is not eminently good and just, yet whose misfortune is brought about not by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty. Okay, so uh, the man must not be eminently good and uh, uh, but whose, and whose misfortune is caused not by his own weakness, or by his own bad habits, vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty some of judgment or some weakness of judgment. That is the cause of, uh, you know, uh, downfall of the tragic hero. He must be the one who is highly renowned and prosperous. All tragic heroes have a tragic flow or hamathia that can lead downfall in such a way as not to offend the audience's sense of justice. Okay, there is a fatal flaw or a tragic flaw or amartya. That is a Greek term used for fatal flaw or tragic flaw, which is the cause for the responsible of downfall of the tragic hero. Okay, so uh, audience, uh, you know, they feel that there is some poetic justice at least. They don't feel that the man did not, uh, the man did not deserve, should not feel that the man did not deserve such punishment. Okay, so they should feel that okay, whatever happened to him was tragic, but okay, the things could not have been otherwise. The tragedy must have an emotional effect on its audience, and through pity and fear, if it passes, can fear if it passes. Early on. <laughs> And thereby, you know, Uh, 
is a very important point because this is the idea of plausibility poetry concerning research Okay, so uh, yes, sir. Please continue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, the universal, not the particular, should be stressed. Now, uh, what is the meaning of universal? See, uh, you know, uh, you cross a lot of these terms even today. You know, universal. Uh, what, for example, is universal? So, uh, universal is across uh, what is true across time and space. Okay, so uh, when someone very close to you, uh, close to us, you know, uh, close to a person falls ill or dies, we feel sad, we are grief stricken. That is universal. It happens in all countries, in all places, across time. Okay, so the effect of uh, poetry should have a universal appeal. That is uh, the argument of Aristotle, as opposed to history, which contains concerns itself with uh, particular instances. Okay, so a uh, poetry should have a more universal appeal, and poetry should also concern itself with the plausible. You know what can possibly happen what looks you know uh, feasible okay uh, so you know, such we, we should be able to relate to it we can uh, we should tell ourselves yes such a thing is possible such a thing is possible whether it has actually happened or not so that is the idea of plausibility okay the poet must give close attention to diction or language uh, it is the thoughts expressed through language that are of utmost concern. Okay. Uh, Aristotle does not address the didactic value of Plato or literature. Okay. So he doesn't talk about the didactic function. What is the didactic function? The moralizing or the preaching function of poetry. He doesn't talk about that. Okay. Now, uh, let us look at uh, let us look at uh, the the material. Uh, you know, uh, objectives. Uh, unit three: Aristotle's theory of imitation. Okay, uh, what are the components of this? Aristotelian view of mimesis, the media of mimesis, rhythm, language, and harmony. Theatre as a unifier of arts, rendering of lexis through rhythm and tone, ancient dance used in theatre, unification of dance with words. Okay, so how theatre is a complete art in itself because it incorporates so many elements in it. Okay, you have dance, you have spectacle, you have music, there is rhythm, there is harmony, there is language. Okay. Now, uh, there is a uh, there is a difference between uh, Plato's idea of mimesis or imitation and Aristotle's idea of imitation. We are now 
uh, we have come back to the text the even the on page 28 of the material given to you with aristotle the concept of mimesis undergoes a major transformation it retains the condition of being a copy of a model but the platonic denigration is reversed okay uh you know plato also speaks about Im imitation in a negative way but aristotle does not do that when an artist makes an object he incorporates certain universal elements in it but he does fall short of any absolute model of universality okay uh, you know so when an artist produces art it has aspects of the universal also in it do not all which is why uh, you know it has a positive purpose okay <clears throat> so this is the you know view of imitation and how you know, drama incorporates uh, you know rhythm tone dance and the different kinds of dances which were uh, you know used uh, which were uh, you know performed in aristotelian uh, aristotle's times okay so uh, this is unit 3 summing up aristotle succeeded in salvaging the great contribution of the ancient greeks namely the art of theater from the merciless damnation by plato through providing a constructive definition of mimesis his definition became the ground on which all the magnificent edices of various theories of representation were created from the renaissance to the modern times in them all as was laid down by aristotle it was accepted that mimesis is based upon a study of life as we see it and that it is pleasant and educative aristotle imparted a metaphysical moral and aesthetic worth to mimesis uh, the introductory class on literary theory and criticism so we discussed a few basic issues on uh, what is literature what is criticism and what is theory we discussed that criticism is more of interpretation criticism comes under the overall term of liberal humanism which is supposedly a quality and theory on the other hand is avowedly critical so uh, that was one of the issues that we had discussed the second thing is we had also discussed about we had also discussed uh something about the classical tradition we had discussed something about the classical tradition in literary theory and criticism so uh, uh because uh, we are studying english literature and uh, you know originally at least english was not the mother tongue of any of us in india it was the mother tongue of uh, you know people in england uh so england being in europe it was more influenced by uh you know their philosophical traditions literary theory and criticism both were influenced by their traditions okay so what do i mean by their traditions their traditions means ancient greece and roman criticism okay uh and theory now because uh, you know uh, these are also called uh, this is also called classical criticism classical criticism you know the classical age goes back to 8 centuries before christ till about 4 centuries before christ that is the classical age in greece and rome so while we talk about a uh, greek and roman you know culture and uh, theory and criticism 
we have to keep in mind that it is mainly the greek tradition that we'll be talking about it is mainly the greek tradition that we will be talking about just a word on why we talk only about the greek tradition because the greek tradition influenced the roman tradition so there are similarities to be found between both traditions since greek is the older tradition we will look at the greek tradition okay now when we uh, look at the greek tradition in the last class i remember uh, we had specifically mentioned two theorists one of them is plato and the other one is aristotle plato and aristotle were master and pupil plato and aristotle were master and pupil so we had touched upon uh, some of the ideas of plato and aristotle one thing which i have noticed is that the first uh this is block 2 i think the first block contains an overview of everything that is to come later in the course the first block contains an overview it gives you an introduction to the most important ideas that are going to come later on in the course so for example we had done aristotle plato we had touched a little on uh, you know philip sidney we had touched a little on uh, derrida okay so all these will be done in detail in later courses but for today's class it is on classical criticism today's class is on classical criticism mg5 literary criticism and theory and then classical criticism okay so when we are looking at classical criticism we are looking at the criticism which originated or which was practiced in ancient greece and i told you who the two important thinkers are plato and aristotle <coughs> now plato wrote a book the name of the book was republic he wrote a book the name of the book was republic so uh, in that uh, it is divided into many books or parts and uh, book 10 uh, of the uh, republic book 10 it talks about uh it speaks about uh the place of the imitating arts in the republic now uh let me tell you uh, what is the republic actually why do, why is the book named republic republic is a is a utopia republic is a utopia now what is a utopia a utopia is an imaginary land where everything is supposed to be perfect supposed to be ideal obviously no such place exists in reality but then it serves as a kind of template republic it serves as a kind of template some kind of a blueprint some kind of a model as to how the the ideal state should be the ideal state you know the ideal uh, the unit of government is the state here athens they were all city states sparta so the point is uh, what is the or how should the ideal state be like what should be the education of the citizens of that state 
okay how can they be educated to be virtuous how can they be educated to be virtuous now there uh, he says that poets should be banished from the republic in book 10 of the republic uh, plato did not have a very good opinion of uh, poets so uh, i told you poets are people who not only write poetry but also by extension all literary creator artists so in other words in his time those who wrote tragedy those who wrote comedy those who wrote poetry all of them came under the term poets so he wanted that poets should be banished from the republic he wanted that poets should be banned from the republic now why did he say such a thing why did he say such a thing he believed in forms plato believed in this idea of forms f o r m s forms so he believed in the ideal form somewhere in the realm of abstraction somewhere in the realm of abstraction okay so the ideal is not found in the real world okay now uh, try to understand this a little the world of forms the ideal form is an abstraction okay what we see in the real world is an imitation of the ideal form when a poet talks about what he sees in the real world that is an imitation of an imitation let me try to give you an example let us say a table now according to plato there is an there is the form of a table in the world of abstractions the ideal world and according to plato that was the real world okay which means you know he always had these very high standards to live up to and he wanted others also to uh, live by these very high standards so there is an ideal form the form of a table the table that we see let us say in our colleges or in our offices that is an imitation of the ideal table okay and when a poet writes about the table the poem becomes an imitation of an imitation okay imitation of an imitation now he said he felt plato felt that such imitation such imitation destroys the originality or the creativity of an individual thereby taking him farther away from the path of virtue from the path of virtue okay so that is the reason which plato gave for making the statement that poets should be banished from the republic poets should be banished from the republic okay now after plato came aristotle now aristotle was the pupil of plato the student of plato aristotle was not so hard hearted towards uh, poets okay on the other hand aristotle said you know he gave a very high position to poets okay uh, you know he also said that they serve a useful purpose and uh, you know how do they serve a useful purpose we'll come to that slightly later but and also uh, aristotle also uh, you know uh, theorized on tragedy 
he also theorized on tragedy okay so here one of the purposes of two purposes let us say one of them is you know serving as a delight in itself when you see a tragedy because ancient greece you know they are talking about uh, you know uh, performance we are not talking about reading so one of the uh, you know aims of tragedy was to give pleasure and the other more important aim was to serve the purpose of catharsis was to serve the purpose of catharsis i'm sure all of you have come across this term catharsis is you know purgation catharsis catharsis means purgation okay purgation of what here purgation of excess emotion purgation of an excess constituent element of the body but all you look at all of us are mixture of four humors the human body and an imbalance of any one of the humors results in uh, you know a disease or sickness and it is opposite to good health so here also one of the purposes of tragedy was to serve the purpose of catharsis catharsis the purgation of excess emotions in an individual you know uh uh which aristotle conceived of uh, or which aristotle uh, theorized about the function of tragedy the function of the tragic poet okay so uh, this was only one of the things that aristotle did because you know aristotle went on and very elaborately he gave us a very elaborate theory of uh, a tragedy okay so you see that plato and aristotle they were uh, diametrically opposed they were diametrically opposed you know plato arguing for banishing poets from the commonwealth and aristotle you know on the other hand expounding let us say the benefit of poetry the tragedy poetry and the different constituent elements of poetry okay so now uh, let us look at uh, the study material i'm sure all of you have uh, the study material in front of you now uh, let us look at uh, you know what <coughs> uh, what the study material says so uh, i'll uh, read out from the introduction of unit 1 what are the features of classical criticism what are the features of classical criticism okay uh, the difference between our culture that appreciates literature and even the performing arts through printed or electronically stored documentation and the ancients for whom a performance was hardly repeated the same way is precisely this we can store a work of art and postpone our response to it the ancients had to perform and respond at the same time so in other words we the ancients did not have books they did not have audio files they did not have video files like we do okay so the performance and the reception of the performance took place simultaneously took place at the same time the actors acting out their roles the audience responding to the play but nowadays what is the difference somebody writes a play we can hear it 10 days later 10 years later 100 years later and then decide how we respond to that okay so that is the basic difference between 
uh, appreciate in literature in the ancient times and in the present day. This resulted in a special aesthetics in which nearness between the speaker or actor or poet or singer and his or her audience becomes crucial. So there is a nearness. There is a nearness. How is there a nearness? You, know, you have you have a stage on which you know the play is being performed, and you have the audience sitting in front of the stage. Okay. In contrast, in the modern time, what do we have? A poet might be sitting uh, ten thousand miles away. He might be sitting there. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. He can't see me. I can't see him. But still, I am able to read his works. Because of this immediacy of communication in all ancient arts, whether poetry, music, or even philosophical dialogue, a strong emotional response from the audience also became inevitable. A strong emotional response on the part of the audience also became inevitable. You know, something is happening right in front of you. Your response is also immediate, and the response is also at an emotional level. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the response is also at an emotional level. Emotions therefore acquired a primary importance in all the ancient literary concepts, such as those of imitation or mimesis, inspiration, ethics, or pleasure. Pleasure also known as hedon. So emotional response, that is the main uh, expression which you have to keep in mind. Why emotional response is important? Because Plato and Aristotle had diametrically opposed views. Plato felt that you know, stirring up emotions is not good for the ideal citizen in the Republic. Aristotle thought that tragedy served a useful purpose by uh, purging the audience of excess emotions the balance and stability were regained. Okay. When one thinks about the Greek art of imaginative creation, there are a couple of concepts that are very different from our present day ideas. So what are we doing here? We are looking at features of classical criticism, classical literature, and how classical literature is different from modern day literature. For the Greeks, for the Greeks, the individual poet, playwright, dramatists, or musician was not supposed to make his or her mark by novelty or individual style that departed from tradition in a big way. Okay, so what is the point here? That you are not, as a creative artist, you are not supposed to to uh, deviate very widely from tradition. Okay. Also, the ideas of the artists were not welcome if they were shocking or very individualistic in thought. Okay, if at all they were very individualistic or shocking and did not conform to tradition, established tradition, such ideas were not welcome. And then a third point. An important point: the poet was not the creator in the modern sense of the term. Was not the creator of his work. Okay, the uh, creative, the poet was only a medium. The poet was only a medium through which the muses, who served as inspiration, the muses acted. Okay, if you look at Indian tradition also, what do you find? That Kalidas was divinely inspired. Okay, He, in a sense, became a medium for the transmission of a great writing, you know, uh, for the goddess Saraswati, okay, or for, uh, you know, some god or goddess. Not only the inspiration to create came from the muses, the creation of the artist 
was also a copy of the world that had been created by a force much greater than him or her okay so here we come to this concept of mimesis or imitation the poet is talking about the world but the world itself was created by a, a superior force a much higher force theories of art for this reason believe the artist to be an imitator so this theory believes that artist is an imitator why is the artist an, or how is the artist an imitator because he imitates what has already been created by a higher force another significant concern of the greeks was the ethical value of art so ethical value now what is ethics ethics is you know uh, the field of study which concerns itself with ideas of what is right or what is not not only must the poet an imitative painter of this world created by the gods acknowledge his or her lower place he or she must ensure that whatever they produce is also universal so one is what are the two things which the poet has to keep in mind the first thing is that the poet occupies a lower position okay because he is imitating a world which is created by the gods second thing is there was a responsibility on the poet to create something which was useful good and useful so that was very important you know what you write has to be good and useful to the audience the ancients left room for innovation but not for experimentation of doubtful work there was no room for a philosophy that advocated art for art sake sometimes this concern for social worth of art led to a severe censure of the artist as in the case of plato who thought that no art can be as can be good as all of it consists of unreality and untruth okay so uh, you see that plato did not like poets or poetry so what is the ground on which he did not like poets that poets wrote untruths because they spoke of imitations of imitation or as in the case of aristotle it led to a patronization of theatrist because for aristotle the artist brought us knowledge and a deeper understanding of the world so diametrically opposite views of plato and aristotle aristotle last but not the least the capacity of art to please by emotional arousal was also a demand on the poetic imagination okay so to do, to arouse to impact someone emotionally that also calls for poetic imagination the poet has to think about the various devices or strategies or ways in which he or she can arouse the audience the emphasis in ancient times was not so much on making art a vehicle for ideology or social reform but more on its capacity to entertain so nowadays you know art also is used as a vehicle for ideology we have certain political ideas and you use art as a vehicle for conveying those ideas but in ancient days what was the purpose of art the purpose of art was to entertain poetry and drama must please in a healthy way and provide an emotional outlet from the daily state of tension emotional outlet from the daily state of tension this aim of art as emotional cure was developed by aristotle through his concept of catharsis okay so this is aristotle's conceptualization of uh, you know uh, the function of art okay then uh, we'll uh, end the first unit we'll end the first unit with the summing up before you know uh, going into detail in plato's works 
and Aristotle's works. The main issues in classical times were different from our modern concerns, not only because of major cultural differences, but because of a different technology that governed the conditions of communication, different technology. As in the ancient world, literary compositions were not entirely secular. You know, they could not be separated from religion because religion, literature, life, all were very closely interconnected. Okay? And you could not really deviate from religion. It was often part of religious or semi-religious activities. The spoken word was constantly associated with the physical movements of the orator or the actor or the chorus. The lone reader poring over a manuscript was an exceptional situation and discussion among the intellectuals were again very limited. So they did not have the luxury or the technology to read individually as we do today. You know, I can take a play, I can take a poem and I can sit at home and read it whenever I feel like reading it. But these people, the ancients did not have that luxury. Okay, they had to watch it and react emotionally instantly. Okay, so uh, that is the first unit of uh, this. Now, uh, <clears throat> let us uh, go to uh, Plato on imitation and art. Now, Plato, he had his own ideas on imitation and art. Okay. So I already gave, uh, I already discussed, I already discussed, you know, uh, what Plato's ideas were. What did Plato say? Uh, you know, uh, that a poet should be banned from the Republic. So I'll just read out a portions of, I'll just read out portions from unit two, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can see how he gives his reasons for not, you know, uh, you know, uh, for not liking poets. Uh, see, the easiest thing is to imagine Plato as an enemy of art because he viewed art as inferior copies of the ultimate reality. So how did he view art? as inferior copies of ultimate reality. So you have an ultimate reality, which is the world of forms. Then you have a world of the real world, or the world that we see around us. And then you have a poet imitating that world. And then, so it becomes an inferior copy of the ultimate reality. Plato's point was that representation through art was inferior to the ultimate truth. So representation through art was inferior to the ultimate truth. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, Plato's idea was that, you know, there is going to be an ideal republic and uh, the citizens are going to be, uh, you know, very virtuous. They are going to be very uh, you know, people of exceptional merit. So he did not want, he did not want anything inferior to corrupt the mor moral fiber of the people of, you know, uh, Greece, Athens. So that was, uh, you know, Plato's contention. Okay. So he wanted that, uh, you know, uh, uh, poetry should not find a place in uh, the ideal republic. In his republic, he has given us a picture of what a perfectly governed state should be and how that state can be created by educated young men and women. Okay. The rulers and the helpers of utopia of this, of the platonic utopia or republic are not mere administrators or military strategists. 
they are philosophers who have a deep understanding of the nature of things okay so uh, philosopher kings the kant's concept is that of plato wanted that the ideal ruler is the philosopher king king who also has uh, a deep understanding of philosophy most poetry and then he also gives reasons plato gives reasons why you know poetry should be banished he gives reasons why poetry should be banished you know what were the poems or the um, the poems that were in circulation at that time say for example homer you know uh, homer's uh, works were available at that time homer wrote two epics the uh, odyssey uh, and the iliad most poetry of the contemporary greek curriculum homer in particular was unsuitable as it showed gods and heroes with moral infirmities and sometimes even savagery so what did it show it showed gods and goddesses the epics what do you find in epics you know even think of our own indian epics what do you find here gods and goddesses in all their infirmities so what are infirmities in all their weaknesses so that is not something which one would like to emulate that is not something which one would like to emulate you don't want people watching this and then trying to imitate these gods and goddesses so in other words the gods and goddesses served as very poor role models okay which is why plato had this antagonism or uh, he found he thought poetry to be unsuitable okay also most of this poetry was sung to the lyre in those times lyre is a musical instrument plato pointed out that only those melodic scales should be used which inculcate heroism and courage which inculcate heroism and courage so certain musics a certain kinds of music they uh, you know inculcate or bring out certain emotional responses in us and plato favored only that kind of music which you know uh, uh, inculcated in individuals or uh, gave individuals a sense of heroism and courage okay and uh, enacting plays was harmful because in acting a person gave up his own demeanor and adopted the behavior of another person often not very praiseworthy okay uh, so this was something you know you are uh, when you are playing out a role in acting you know uh, uh, you know you might be uh, behaving in a certain way that is not very praiseworthy even though you are fulfilling the needs of the portrayal of that character okay so he felt that also corrupts the actor so all these are reasons all these are uh, the reasons why plato was against you know poets in the ideal republic okay and then of course you know you had the main uh, you had the main uh, objection which is that it does not teach anything of merit poetry because it is an imitation of an imitation it is an imitation of an imitation so it is twice removed from reality is twice removed from reality so that is why uh, he did not like poets okay so uh, this theory of forms which uh, you know i discussed in the introduction i gave you i said there is an ideal world a world of forms and uh, that is what uh, plato spoke about thus imitation is not only a production it is a following of something which the imitator must set before herself or himself for every kind of activity there must be an ideal to be followed and every ideal or form must have its superform 
okay but to end to avoid endless regression plato postulated that there was a primary form which was the essential nature of every object or even thought the form was immutable and complete and could not be embodied in anything of this world okay so he spoke of this world of ideas and he the ideal or form the ideal uh, or form which is not to be found in the real world so we always try to approximate whatever we do we try to approximate to this world uh, to the form which exists in abstraction okay the form was immutable and complete and could not be embodied in anything of this world it was immutable the form was immutable means unchanging okay worldly objects are idols or imitative images of the ideal forms and artist pictures or poetic descriptions are in turn images of the objects of the world so you have the world of forms you have the real world around you which is an imitation of the world of forms and then a poet is talking about the real world so the poet is twice removed from reality okay so a poetry can never be a faithful representation of reality poetry can never be a faithful representation of reality so this is uh, you know this is what a plato envisaged okay so uh, i gave the example of a table now plato gives the example of a knife okay uh, i'll read out two two sentences from that from that portion the worldly knife falls short of the ideal knife knife k n i f e knife there is an ideal wife a knife and there is a worldly knife the one that we see in the kitchen or in our homes so this is an imitation of that ideal knife all art according to plato remains a turning away from the truth now the real life that we see around us is not exactly the ideal life which is the reality okay so the reason he says poet should be banished is they poet poetry does not represent reality faithfully or truthfully okay so uh, uh why this is important is because even today we are influenced by you know uh, that is the beginning that is the beginning of the critical and the theoretical tradition uh, in uh, english literary criticism you know they look to ancient greece for inspiration and most of the ideas even down to the victorians uh, uh, the elizabethan age they were either a reaction to or a continuation of these ideas propagated by plato and aristotle okay so in book 10 of the republic you know this is you know, very often you will come across uh, this particular idea uh, this is a, a, a ground which plato gives for banishing the poets so the artist has this is page 22 of the unit of the book of the block so the artist has neither knowledge nor correct opinion about the goodness or badness of the things he represents apparently not so the poet to as artist will be pretty ignorant about the subjects of his poetry completely ignorant it's in the form of a dialogue but he will go on writing poetry in spite of his ignorance of all he writes about and will represent anything that pleases ignorant multitude what else can he do well i concluded we seem to be pretty well agreed that the artist knows little or nothing about the subjects he represents and that his art is something that has no serious value and this applies to all tragic poetry epic or dramatic yes entirely agreed 
so in this dialogue you can see that uh, you know poetry is of no use that is the uh, conclusion okay so uh, this is the main idea of uh, you know uh, plato uh now uh, i'll just uh, read out uh, we'll just discuss a couple of points more on plato before we end our discussion on plato because all of this is interrelated you know his ideas on life his ideas on republic his ideas on poetry all of that uh, all of these are interrelated the artist as the promulgator of ignorance cannot have a place in re in republic okay just as the appetites must be controlled and kept under constant check through resolve reason and virtue to prepare the soul for knowledge so should the guardians endowed with endowed with superior training and selective breeding control the general population to keep a society productive and law abiding okay so uh, you know think of it as uh, you know a higher a higher self and a lower self a higher self and a lower self okay uh, the higher self has uh, both a cognitive component the cognitive is concerning uh, functioning of reason and uh, it also has affect a certain kind of emotional component also but the higher self is opposed to the lower self where the lower self is the seat of let us say the baser emotions the baser emotions okay so uh, plato would say you know the cultivation of the higher self is what is required to make one a virtuous citizen the cultivation of the higher self so poetry doesn't help us in cultivating the higher self okay it appeals you know uh, probably to our lower self you know which is why you know he did not approve of it okay so what is the idea that you have to keep your appetites under control appetites means you know your desires under control okay so uh, that is where the higher self comes uh, becomes important okay uh, just as the appetites must be controlled and kept under constant check through resolve reason and virtue to prepare the soul for knowledge so should the guardians endowed with superior training and selective breeding control the general population to keep a society productive and law abiding okay plato felt that for young students most epic poetry of homer and hesiod was weak in morals as it showed gods and heroes in a poor light plato did not think that the power of art to show human weaknesses and contradictions in the divine conduct portrayed in the ancient myths was part of the investigative process even to act a role was disastrous for a future guardian of the republic as it prevented the development of a single unflawed ethos in him okay so uh, you know the reason he gives for uh, Now basically, it boils down to uh, all the reasons that he gives for not studying uh, poetry and banishing the poets. Okay, uh, as we uh, let us sum up, this is page twenty-four on Plato. Platonic condemnation of art stems from his metaphysical and utopian premises. Metaphysical is a branch of philosophy, and utopian. Utopian we have discussed. Plato was well aware of the military weaknesses of the Athenian state in comparison with the disciplined armies of the Spartans. Okay, so you see, this is putting uh, you know literary uh, theory in the context of in the context of you know a broader uh, in the context of the broader you know a cont uh, broader uh, socio political condition of the time. Okay, and, and what is that? it is basically that uh, the spartans you know the spartan uh, they were very austere they were very austere and very disciplined and they had a stronger army okay so he wanted 
and Aristo Plato belonged to Plat uh, Athens. Athens and Sparta were separate city states. He wanted Athens to be, you know, uh, to be able to stand up to the Spartans, the Spartan armies. So he wanted to cultivate, educate. He wanted to produce youth of the highest order, the youth of the highest order, so that they could be a match for the Spartans in all aspects. So that is a broader context. Okay, and that is why he wanted poetry to be abolished. It may also be noted that by the time of Plato, a decline in the quality of theatrical productions had already set in. Okay, another thing is that Plato was, you know, wrote his observations, you know, based on the prevailing situation of art in those times. So by then, art was already on the decline, you know, the production of artistic, uh, the, the output of artistic production was not of a very high order. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, unit two. Now let us go to unit three. Okay. Uh, 